welcome once again to the sage and thank you for being with us this journey we're on is one that is very dear to our hearts within the past few weeks we have embarked on a journey of discussing with you and with some selected guests on set about nation building, about continuing our journey to rebuild our beloved country. We had reflected and looked back on the recent elections and we had indeed come to the conclusion that despite whatever many of us may feel, that in fact, there were many, many monumental achievements from that election. We had opined that indeed, it may well someday go down in history as one of the greatest acts of patriotism in recent times because we voted in large numbers. We came out, we voted. We wanted the best in terms of leadership. Our young people came out as never before and voted. Unprecedented interest in selecting our leadership, in making our country a better place. Perhaps the waters are settling but all is still good because we continue on the journey, the journey of working together to make our country the great country it really is and should be. And in that regard, in the past few episodes, we also started discussing things we think are critical in working together to build our nation. And we pointed out that we all need to realize that every single Nigerian has an important role to play. It will be done by all of us. Not a group, not a section, not just our leaders and so on and so forth but every single citizen has a role to play. And so we are discussing within this program and many subsequent ones to come about examples of that, the how of it. In the episodes before this one, we engaged some very important and articulate interesting young people on how young people in this country must continue and build on the momentum already on ground and do their bits starting today, not even tomorrow, to build our great country. In this particular episode, we look at another sector of our nation, this time the creative arts. I have always believed that there's great power, there's great potential in what the creative artists amongst us can do. It is indeed things like music, art, poetry, dance, and so on and so forth that play a great role in inspiring. Somebody once said that if music be the food of love, play on. Because they lift us, they inspire us, they give us hope. They point us in the right and good direction. And so in our job, in our joint task of nation building, this is indeed a time to turn to our creative artists and ask them, to use their God-given talents to uplift this country, to inspire all of us, to support us as we come together to work to make our country great. 
And so privileged, truly privileged, we on the Sage have with us one of the most beautiful examples of a Nigerian that is wonderfully endowed when it comes to creativity and the creative arts. Stay with us. We will introduce our guest to you. Welcome back to The Sage, and thank you so much for coming back to be with us. Yes, before the intermission, I promised you we will introduce you to our guests. It is indeed a prized guest, but one that is not new to The Sage. Um, he has blessed us and graced this set many times in the past with his presence. It is a real, real pleasure to introduce no other than Mr. D.K. Chukumerije to the stage. Thank to welcome you. you once again. I don't have to this time to do a long introduction. <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> he says, I, thankfully. I one for long introductions. Yeah. I, I really appreciate being here again. DK, thank you for being here. DK is a household name. I am brave enough to say that in this country and embodies things so important to us on the stage. And in this particular series, we're, we're talking, we know, we're rolling out because DK is probably one of the most prolific spoken word artists in this country. Um, you're a household name. But in addition to his talents, um, which he, he strives all the time to bring home to all of us, to, to uplift us with, to enrich us with. DK is also a, a beautiful, I, I say, uh, a young man, human being, you know, the kind any mother will be proud to say, this is my child. And the kind any nation will be proud to have because he is one that al has always impressed us by his passionate love for this country. He started it many long when he was a lot younger, when many of us weren't even thinking about it. DK has always been there. He's always been consistent. Um, unity. This country is great. We are all one. All of that and more and put it out there. So many performances. And that's what has made you a household name. And so you fit in so much with the discussion on the set today, where we're saying, no matter what has happened, we did succeed in many ways with, with the election. We saw unprecedented youth activity. We still all want one major thing a great Nigeria, a Nigeria that works for us, all of us. And I am saying that creative art is such an important part of this effort. And so I, I'm, I throw it to you and I say, what do you think? I uh, agree absolutely that the creative arts are critical to nation building, particularly in the case of Nigeria. And uh, to understand why, we need to understand that uh, change in a, in, in a country like Nigeria requires much more than policy reform or legal and institutional reform uh, because of the uniqueness of the Nigerian system or the Nigerian situation. We live in a country where it is very routine to find a divergence between what the law says on paper and how people act. That if you were actually to carry out an audit of our legal, our formal legal and institutional frameworks, you'll find them significantly robust, significantly comprehensive. On paper, we have a lot of good laws, a lot of good policies, a lot of good institutions. But the Nigerian seems to have a knack for doing things differently from the way they are supposed to be done on paper. And not just at the highest levels, but at all, all levels. levels. 
There is hardly any public institution, no matter its visibility, that you can walk into and find that the procedure, the actual procedure, is as it's supposed to be on paper. And the reason for this discrepancy is that there is such a thing as a, a Nigerian way of doing things, a Nigerian system, a culture, a way of thinking, of approaching issues. A Nigerian time. A Nigerian time, <laughs> you know, that we are all socialized into from birth. You know, that this is how you do things, you know. And so only what Nigerians would call a JJC would come into this situation and expect that it will run the way it's supposed to run. Every Nigerian knows it doesn't run that way. If you want things done, this is how you actually do things. And that culture, that way of thinking, needs to change before any tinkering you're doing on the formal laws and institutions can be effective. Because no matter what law you give a Nigerian, the way he or she would implement it will be very different from what you imagined. So I always tell people that if you were to, for some reason, take all Nigerians and move them to the US, and take all Americans and move them to Nigeria, that within a few short years, the US will become Nigeria. <laughs> and Nigeria will become the will US. Will Nigerians become the US? <laughs> <laughs> because of our way of doing things. So that culture, that, that way of, of thinking and approaching issues needs to be addressed. And these are not things that you address solely with intellectual tools, because it has to do with the heart, it has to do with attitude, it has to do with mindset, it has to do with values. And perhaps culture? And culture. So laws and institutions sit on culture, they sit on values. It doesn't matter how good the law is, what's the subsoil that it's sitting on? What's the cultural landscape that it's sitting on? And this is where art becomes very, very critical because art deals with those subterranean issues. It deals with issues of values, it deals with issues of mindset, it deals with issues of the heart. And that is the power of the artist because we are tinkering with those things. And I always tell people that if you shift mindset, you might find that you don't need so much constitutional reform or legal reform to actually get the country working. Mm -hmm. Because many of the legal and institutional tools are there. Mm -hmm. But the person that has to use those tools needs to be reconditioned. Absolutely. And that is where art is so, so important. So that when we talk about justice, and when we talk about uh, fairness, and when we talk about integrity, it is the job of the artist to take these concepts and turn them from dry intellectual uh, theories or concepts that people read on paper and make them emotive, an emotive concept that people desire, that people becomes relevant to people. So an artist is able to make a concept come alive in society so that people are able to then see why they need to practice it rather than just have it as a, a tool in their intellectual you know, kitty. On a sheet of paper or on the web. Let, let me, I, I think that is so profound. Let me, uh, let me say that Many years ago, I thought to myself that the problem with Nigeria, we also often say the problem, is insufficient patriotism. Mm -hmm. That if we were really patriotic and loved our country, then we would be, we would feel obliged, we would feel passionate about doing things that would progress this country. And that's, and therefore, you, I think you're so right. It is emotive. Pa patriotism, passion, is, a, is an emotion. Absolutely. Emotion, therefore, capable of being stared and driven in the right direction because we feel love, we feel um, commitment, and so on and so forth. So absolutely, the, it is about emotion, it is emotive, and like you're saying, it, art is very much... Very, very important. Very much that. It's something I often uh, engage with people about, the very concept of patriotism. You know, like you said, patriotism is, a, is first of all an emotion. First of all an emotion. It's not, it's, it's like, in, indeed, in, very simply, patriotism is love for your country. And love always has an emotional profile. It has emotional roots. You cannot order someone to love you. You can order somebody to do something, but you can't order them to love you. 
So patriotism is not something you can tell people to do. You have to inspire patriotism in people. Absolutely. And the way people fall in love with each other is the same way they fall in love with the country. You fall in love with someone by focusing on attributes about them that are attractive. It's the same thing with the country. To inspire people to love the country, you need to point out to them the qualities of that country that are attractive. And these are some of the narratives we've grown up with over the years, that we only talk about Nigeria in a negative sense. Absolutely. So we are very, very conscious of the weaknesses, of the shortcomings of our country. But we are not as conscious of its positives and of its strengths and of its potential. And one of the jobs of the artist, one of the things that an artist can do to help people love their country. Like I said, I can't make you love Nigeria. I can't order you to love Nigeria. But as an artist, I can inspire you to love Nigeria by painting a picture, by showing you things about Nigeria that you gloss over, you ignore, you probably didn't know, because it's part of that culture that I was talking about for us to be toxic, for us to be negative in our assessments of our country. You know, and um, that is just not a healthy environment. Even if you want to dismiss Nigeria, first of all, take into account her considerable strength and potential. You can't come to a conclusion about Nigeria when you haven't weighed both sides of the scale, where all you focus on is the negatives, because that's all that you're fed with every day. I mean, go into any bus or a conversation starter in Nigeria, just look at the person beside you and say, this country, now wow. And immediately they will begin to vomit. No road, no lights, no. Everybody just you can talk for hours just with this country in a while. But if you ask somebody, can you tell me something that Nigeria has done for you for which you are grateful? It takes that question. They, they stop and start thinking, because it, the brain has not is not used to thinking about that. Can you tell me things about Nigeria that make you proud that you you can boast on the public stage? on account of what your country has done? Can you tell me things about Nigeria that you would miss if you lived in another country? Would you be able to begin to just flow in an to, to answer those questions? But if I ask you, what do you hate about Nigeria? What irritates you about Nigeria? You don't need any prompting. You don't need any preparation. You can begin to flow for hours. You know, to agree with you, uh, it was said that where you see two or three Nigerians gathered, they're probably discussing the problems with Nigeria. Yeah. And I was shocked too when I came. I worked for many years internationally abroad, and and when I I came to realize that we, again, even there in our expatriate setting, that when two or three Nigerians meet each other and are talking, we again begin to discuss the problems with Nigeria. And I also then was struck by the fact that no other, particularly African country, ever did that. You could never get the other countries, Kenya, name it, and so on and so forth, together talking about what is wrong with their country in front of you. Mm. We, but we Nigerians are forever doing that. Yeah. And yet, in reality, we're much greater than most of those yeah. countries. Yeah. It's, like I said, it's socialization. It's the way we were raised. You know, we were raised. It's like having a dysfunctional relationship where people love each other, but the only language for expression is insult and abuse. They never learned how to use any other way of showing concern, or because it's passion. It's passion that drives Nigerians to talk about Nigeria. It's the passion they it's have for yeah, the country. It's actually the passion, yeah. the love, the concern yeah. for the country exactly. that makes them talk but it about it. It just comes out in toxic ways because it's the only language we've learned. It's just like, the only language Nigerians know for analyzing their socioeconomic condition or their, their condition of life is a tribalistic language. So they would blame poverty on Fulani people or they would blame insecurity on Muslims. But they don't, they don't have any other language for analyzing their condition. So poverty may be caused by bad governance or bad policy, but we don't have the tools for saying that Instead, you say it's because an Alsa man is in office. But it's not because an Alsa man is in office. It's the policy that he has and his faithfulness in implementing that policy that is the problem. 
Dike, Dike, hold your thought. Let, let me just tell you how profound, how true what you just said. A friend of mine recently um, was having problems with her tenant in her house. And um, the way she, she handled it was to say, he's a bad tenant, a difficult, because he's an Igbo man. If it wasn't an Igbo man I put there now, he wouldn't be a bad tenant. And that is striking, you see. That is the way we handle it, by pitching on that where they come from as a reason for the bad behavior. Yeah. It's, it's orientation. It, yeah. it's, it's simply orientation. What you, it's like in the olden days, things are not going well in my house. I begin to look around for a witch. Or, or I'm ill, I've been treating myself, it's not working. It must be witchcraft from the village. Because this is the thinking. There are other situations where somebody might start thinking, no, maybe I need to run different tests. There must be a rational explanation. But when you've been oriented a certain way, if things are not going well, you look around for who is the stranger, who is the other, who can be the cause of this problem. It must be the other tribe or, or the other religion. So all these things are mindset issues. We're not dealing with problems that are peculiar. We're not dealing with problems that other societies other nations have not dealt with and overcome, are not dealing with, you know, but the way we have been oriented to deal with our problems is through the lens of ethnocentrism, religious bigotry, you know, things like that. So those are the things we're used to doing, dealing with our problems. And you need a mindset shift. You need somebody, somebody to say, look, it's the same situation, but there is another way of looking at it. Maybe we're not able to move past this because we're using the wrong tools to deal with that, this problem. Mm -hmm. there, there is a different set of mental tools you can use to address this same issue. You know, so maybe your tenant is being so uh, unruly because there's no light or you, they've been asking you for so long to fix the water and you haven't fixed the water. You know, maybe there are other issues that you're blind to, you're not seeing. And being mentally blind is as acute as being physically blind. It's also a disability. Many Nigerians have a mental, they don't see the other reason why somebody can be acting this way. They just think it must be their religion or their tribe. And the job of the artist is to make you see, to make things that have always been in the room appear because you've been conditioned to not see them. You can walk into this room and not see certain things because of what you're focused on. And the job of the artist is simply to say, hey, there's also a table in here. There's also a chair. There's also a bed. There are also pictures in here. It's not just this thing you're obsessed with. And so art is critical in a situation like we are in Nigeria, where the heart of our problem of our, is our mind. There is no alien class that is holding Nigerians down. This is not a military system where you say, oh, that is the military is our problem. It's not a colonial system where you say, no, in Nigeria, the oppressor is also the oppressed. Because somebody who is being oppressed as a non-indigen in another state will travel to his state and become the oppressive indigen. <laughs> it's the same person that is both the villain and you know, the victor, if you like. It's all in our minds. Our chains are in our minds. Or a huge part of it is in our minds, the way we think about it. Let me take you up, DK. I'm going to ask you now to reflect a little. Um, as the great performance artist you are, and, where, and perhaps share with us one or two of your products where you have tried to do that influence thinking into the right direction. I can think of a few, I've listened to you, but let me, you know, where you have used, whether it's poetry or spoken words or whatever, to, 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 for that positive reorientation. Oh, I mean, it's my entire body of work. I, I haven't done anything that didn't have social connotation in a long time because it's, it's my passion. You know, um, I did The Wall and the Bridge, a poem titled The Wall and the Bridge, because I was reflecting on the irony of Nigerians who are very vocal uh, whenever they experience any type of racism. A Nigerian is one of is one of is is one kind one species of black person you don't want to mess with when it comes to racism because we don't take it sitting down. 
we are very, very strong on, look, you don't discriminate against me on the basis of my color. And yet, I'm going to make you say that poor, that poor <laughs> to us. You won't get away with just, you know, we want to hear it and then we will continue to hear your analysis of it. And the reason it's a it. long poem and um, I haven't done it in a while. Um, uh, if a white man turned and called me nigger, my blood would boil in righteous anger, for the evil of discrimination is clearly established when a white man tries to treat me like rubbish. But if Aousas say Igbos are greedy and crude, and Igbos say Aousas are haughty and rude, and Ijo says Ishekiri must die today, and Eza tells Ezilu there's no other way, if Yorubas declare it is Awo or nothing, and we use federal character to share everything. So before you can even smile and tell me welcome, you must first ask me where my father is from. If those who are settlers, but now indigents, say those who are settlers can't become indigents, and the constitution says we're all citizens, but local governments keep issuing certificates of origin. If my brother passed Jam, but can't go to uni because he is Steve and he's not Kanuri, a uni maid has a quota for its catchment area, so he must go back to Benue or wait one more year. If it's okay to say it's not okay to marry someone just because they are Calabari and that every tribe should have its own side, are we not then practicing apartheid? If you cannot buy land unless you're a native, and cannot find work unless you're a native, and cannot feel safe unless you're a native, how can we then say we're not primitive? Yet you go to London and get their passport. Then settle wherever, however you want. You stand there and fight for equality, but come back and start to use ethnicity. I don't get the logic of thinking is different. To be tribalistic and then to be racist. If you're happy to judge him just hearing his name, whatever you call it, my friend, is the same. That, that, that is beautiful. Yeah. And that, there's so much truth in that, yeah. you know, and, and does indeed demonstrate the power of um, wisdom and art yeah. and the talent of, you know, behind it that allows us to see clearly, yes. more clearly, biases and things that are wrong Absolutely. that we don't even, many times, we don't even process and Absolutely. think as wrong. Which is, uh, which is yeah. the, if you like, the superpower of a creative, an artist, because we are not creators. We are simply creatives. Okay. Everything that exists already exists. The power of the creative is to see new connections between what exists already, to tease out meaning from the old data. So everybody has come and looked at the same set of data and arrived at conclusion A. The power of the creative is you look at the same set of data and say, you know what? You can actually see B, C, D, E, F from, from this. Everybody's like, oh, how? So the creative is able to connect things that you didn't think were connected. So many people know racism is bad, but tribalism is not. And then you come and say, hang on, why? What's the difference that yeah. really this it's thing still is the same thing? Yeah. You know, it's discrimination. You can call that one foreign discrimination, this one is local discrimination. So you suddenly connect things, dots that people have been looking at but just didn't see how they connect. And that's what it means to expand somebody's mental horizon and suddenly make them go, oh, I see. And that expression is always powerful. I see it means I, I may be reading, I may know, but I have until you see, you don't understand. It's not rooted in you. You know, so the creative makes you see. You know, I'm not telling you, I'm just make you see it. So it's a very powerful function. Cre creativity is at the heart of nation building. Because when all is said and done, a nation is fiction. A nation is a story. Because a nation is a shared identity. That's what it is. It's a, shared, it's a sense that you and I are one. We belong together. And that is always a story. You have to tell a story that creates a sense of shared identity. Because uh, there is always pragmatic, rational, objective reasons why you should feel you are different from me. Even two children from the same womb, 
twins can differentiate. They, they can say, look, I'm not you. You are not me. I have my own life. I have my own. To get two even people. Even identical twins. Yes, even identical twins. They, mm -hmm. they, you can, they can, one can say, you're taller than me. Therefore, you know, you can find whatever point to differentiate and say, I'm going to go east, you go west. To get two human beings to work together, you have to tell them a story. You have to tell them a story that gets them to see why we belong together. So the mother of these quarrelsome children might start telling them of how they were in the womb together and you ate together. And you tell them stories and it's the stories that connect them. When people have the same stories, when they feel like they have the same memories, when they feel like they have the same narratives, then they feel like they belong together. So a nation is something you have to tell. You have to speak. A nation is not roads, it's not bridges. It's the story, it's the narrative that you're telling. Nigerians feel so divided because of the narratives that have been passed down, down the line. When you change those narratives, these same people that feels, I mean, I always give the example, look at Europeans. The same Europeans that cannot live in Europe as one country will cross the Atlantic and become Americans. It's the same Italians, it's the same Hungarians, it's the same English, it's the same French. They sail across the Atlantic Ocean and there's a narrative that allows them to see themselves as Americans. But in Europe, they are Italian, they are French. It's the same people. German, name it. Yeah. The only thing that changes is the story you're telling on, on either side. It's how you're framing the narrative. You know, so there is no, there is no, nations are not, they don't drop from the sky. They don't sprout from the earth. They are engineered with narrative and storytelling. That inspires patriotism that and oneness. That inspires patriotism. That inspires you to accept the other as, one, as, as my brother. I'm going to make you share another one. There's another poem of yours that um, I think fits in so well. About. There's the one about the Iroku and so on and so forth. Uh, do you remember? <laughs> do you know the one I'm referring to where you say... Um, um, I think it's uh, the one I call the revolution has no tribe, I, I believe. Do you not know that poverty is not an Ijoman? Yes. He will not spare the rest of us and afflict yes. only the Ishan. Yes, yes. He will step the across the river and come across the border. So when the drums sound, let everybody answer. Nick, I want to be used to start it from the beginning. That is so the beginning. So we fully, fully That's the beginning. <laughs> You know, my poems always start like conversation. Do you not know that corruption is not from Nekede? You'll not hear that Ife has no dealings with Mother Keke. He'll wake up all of our children at night with hunger. So when the drums sound, let everybody answer. Do you not know that HIV AIDS is not Kanuri? He'll not spare the rest of us and kill only the Fulani. He'll set the land ablaze from the Delta to the Sahara. So when the drums sound, let everybody answer. Do you not know that our enemies have no face? They are indigents of no state. They come from no place. And if this boat capsizes, every one of us will go under. So when the drums sound, let everybody answer. Do not say, I am the Iroko, when the forest is burning. Do not say, I am the Obeche, when the forest is burning. Our differences will not stop us from perishing together. So when the drums sound, I beg, make una answer. Our differences will not stop us from perishing together. Absolutely. I re-echo that. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when the drum sounds, let us come together. And that is what we're doing at this precise moment in time. Yeah. Let us come, come together, together and do what needs to be done yeah. Yeah. to make a, our country a place we can all thrive in. Yeah. Beautiful. Do you have one that allows us to see the good things about our country? Um, there are many things I, I do that I believe inspires people to see the good uh, in our country. I often try and begin with simple, uh, sentimental, irrational things about us that are, if you focus on it, would give you, would they evoke a sense of tenderness towards 
Nigeria and yourself as a Nigerian. So for instance, the way we, we talk, coconut head is what you call your dearest. Leave me, Joe, is how to say it best. If you touch me again, eh? It's a language of lovers, laughing and fighting under warm covers. See your mouth. That's how we kiss. <laughs> That's how we invite the other to kiss. Miss you, Ke, is me telling you my world is incomplete without you. But the mother who loves me will say to my face, I'll key you this boy and have another in your place. And when I make her proud, she'll look up and say, yeah, yeah, with your nose like your dad. Come off a road. <laughs> so this is Niger talk. This is the way we talk. And it's very endearing. It's very unique to us. You can identify a Nigerian in the global community just from the way they are talking, just from the way they are bending English, breaking English, colonizing the English language, because that's what we did. They tried to colonize us, but we ended up colonizing their language and using it for our purposes. You know, so if you focus on these small things about us, I, I tell people that Nigeria is a country where you can never get lost. Because as the boss is passing it, to be telling you where he's going. They will be telling you where they are going. You go to London, you have to know how to read, <laughs> read to find your way around. But here on the road, it will be telling you, massacre, 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 massacre. You know? And these are wonderful things about us. You can't walk down any street in Nigeria without finding something cheap to eat. And it can be a huge issue. I, I remember when I went to London to do my master's, came out of the library. I walked down a whole road on, in central London and couldn't find anybody selling biscuits or selling chingong, as we call it in Nigeria, or selling sweet. And I thought to myself, and they say they are a developed country. <laughs> You know, but th this is the eye of the artist to see what is beautiful about yourself. Because if we are waiting for others to tell us, they may never. It's like, you're, it's like having children. It is for you to tell your child what is. If you're, if from outside, they may say to the child, oh, you are short, oh, you are this. But you tell the child, no. You come from a generation of people that have always been, what, you, we are proud about it. And you tell them great stories about how your grandfather was four foot, but you know what he did? So you're, you, you take whatever you have and you find the beauty in it. So I can't remember off the top of my head. I mean, I gave you the example of that poem, my start coconut head, where I just talk about the Nigerian way of showing affection. You know how mothers will say, get out, go, you know, big head. And you just, you just feel so loved when they do that. Or how, you know, a father would frown and not... But you just feel the love. You know, and that is something about us that is, is wonderful. There are many other things, so many other things about Nigeria. Our sense of humor, no matter how serious the situation, a Nigerian would do it with a sense of humor. We'll and be our ability jokes. to laugh at ourselves. At ourselves. If the, the social media is full of it, you know. Yeah. I think that, that, that brought it out so beautifully. Where nothing, no matter how difficult the circumstances in nigeria will find make a joke make a joke out it. of it you yeah. know it, it, it's something that many nigerians who have relocated you know find very difficult about the workspace in other countries you know i have a friend who was complaining like you know, I, I can't even have a conversation i can't even gist in the office i have to just stay on my from eight till five what kind of life is this now nigerians and it doesn't mean we're not productive. We can be giving you the same amount of outputs, but the office environment will be raucous. This one is just in this one. This one is telling this joke. There is a semi-formality about our nature as Nigerians. We're just not an uptight people. And we can get, the, and I love that about our country. You know, I love the fact that we always apply rules. A Nigerian, no, no matter what the rules say, no matter how formal or strict the rules are, Nigerians apply rules with, with empathy and mercy. You know, so if, you know, the boarding gate is supposed to close at 9 o'clock and a Nigerian sees you running across with your back, they will hold the door open for you. There are some cultures where 9 o'clock is 9 o'clock, we shut the door. But a Nigerian can say, I see that woman now, she got rebelled, maybe we we'll make space, in that kind of thing. I love that about my country. It's something that I couldn't understand about other cultures. Okay, fine, the, 
The, the bag gauge limit is 23 kilo, kilograms. This is 23.2. Be cool now. Just, <laughs> just allow just it. Just allow it. You know, and it's like, no. And I like the fact that we, we see, we look, we have some discretion, some humanity in the way we do these things. You know, um, so there are many things about Nigeria that I've come to appreciate. Even let, though, let me add to that. Yeah. You know, I agree with you because, again, like I said, because I've had the, the, the privilege, the blessing to have spent a good part of my own working life out of Nigeria, I have come to appreciate being a Nigerian very much. You know, all through it all, I was proud to be a Nigerian. I continue to be so because I saw qualities that we had as Nigerians, which many others don't. First of all, we're very proud human beings. You know, a Nigerian can never be ashamed of being a Nigerian. Out there, we stand tall and we, we live it. We are also, we come together, actually. Any country where you find Nigerians, we maintain our culture. We have meetings. Mm -hmm. And then this issue of the way we dress. Mm -hmm. We, I think, perhaps more than any African country, have so much culture, culture and tradition still within the way we conduct ourselves, dress-wise, socially, and so on. Mm -hmm. And our Nigerians abroad in the diaspora maintain every bit of it. Mm -hmm. They have meetings, they have community meetings, they have village meetings, all of the things, because we are proud mm -hmm. to be Nigerians. Mm -hmm. We also look at our record abroad. There was a recent publication during the days of a few years ago in the U.S. that showed that the most talented and progressive Africans in the U.S. were actually Nigerians. Yeah, Nigerians. And it's a record we have everywhere. Yeah. So there's so many wonderful things about Nigerians, us yeah. Nigerians. And we need to begin to see them, like you said, hopefully with the support of many creative artists like you, and leave them and believe them and be, be it and not spend so much of our time on the trouble with Nigeria. So I like to tell Nigerians that we're named after the river Niger, the, uh, the Niger River. And in many ways, we share the characteristics of the river Niger. People, it's a, it's a river that we don't, this, again, this goes back to the issue of not knowing who we are, knowing what's good about us. So you're named after a river. You never even ask yourself, what is this river, sir, that I'm named after? You know, because naming is very important in African culture. Mm -hmm. Because often it connects you with the energy of whatever it is you were named after. And the River Niger is a very unique river, very, very unique river. You know, it's one of those rivers, one of the few rivers in the world that, uh, begins its journey by flowing away from the sea. Rivers tend to flow towards the sea. Mm -hmm. The River Niger starts its journey. It's born in Guinea, a few kilometers from the Atlantic Ocean, but it flows away from the Atlantic Ocean towards the desert where it makes a U-turn, a huge U-turn, and then comes back and flows into the sea here in Nigeria. And that tells you that it's an unconventional river. And Nigerians are very unconventional people. That's the root of our creativity. Every, your strength is always your weakness. That's why Nigerians don't like rules. That's why we're so rule averse and very hard to control. That's because we're very unconventional. We tend to be very creative. And Nigeria, even the area that is today Nigeria, has always, through time, produced high levels of artistic and creative ingenuity. Through time, from Ibokuo to Nok culture, we've been doing it even before we became a country because it's the nature of this geophysical area. So it's an unconventional river, we're an unconventional people. Inside that unconventionality is our entrepreneurial spirit. Nigerians are highly entrepreneurial. Absolutely. In fact, other Africans say that if you go to a country and there's no Nigerian there, it means there's no money to be made in that place, just, just leave. We're highly entrepreneurial as a people. The river Niger is also a river that pulls so many other rivers to itself. And that's just how Nigerians are also very social. We're also very, we don't like to go alone. We don't even like to enjoy alone. When we make money, we want it to reach the village. We want it to reach, get to the ground. That's our nature. We're also a highly aspirational people. The River Niger is a live wire of the entire West African region. It is the reason why West Africa is a seat of civilization. All the empires that you know of, all arose in, in close proximity to the river. 
because it's a live wire of civilization. It's the same role that Nigeria plays. So that river that you're named after, it, you, are, you look like it, you resemble it, you carry so many of the attributes of that river. And these are things that need to be articulated. And it is the job of the artist. It is because I'm an artist that I can sit down, look at the map, look at a river, and see how it connects to my country and to my people. That's what I meant about creativity. We're not creators. We just see new meaning in old data. We connect dots that didn't connect before. Wow. wow. And it's so critical <laughs> to nation building. Wow. I mean, it's, I am sitting here transfixed because um, you beautifully, beautifully illustrated what you meant by that the creative artist allows us to see things from a new perspective. I didn't know the River Niger had all these wonderful attributes and that we could find pride in feeling we derive from it. Let me just say that not only that we're excited and inspired, but I think artists have the power also to connect us to the spiritual. Yeah, absolutely. You know, because then absolutely. we realize that our very existence here, the attributes that make us come from things so interconnected with nature and the universe. Absolutely. absolutely. And, and it is the, the artists that often can tap into that, yeah. put it in a language yeah. in which we can all understand yeah and indeed feel yeah. and be enriched from. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a wonderful example yeah, of the power of creativity, of the creative artist. And, and so while it's so evident in, in what you've just demonstrated in our beautiful discussion this, this, on this show, what about all the artists you think um, need to be part of this? Um, and examples of how they can indeed begin to help us change our country's narrative and leave the true narrative of this country. And what I like to say to artists, because it, when you ask me about other artists, you're stepping into very contentious waters. <laughs> there are two broad schools of thought, you know, about the role of the creative in society. There is a school of thought that we call the art for art's sake school of thought, that look, the creative owes no social obligation to anybody, has no higher social calling, and you're free to use your creative, how, your creativity however you want, if you want to, whatever issues you want to talk about, whether they have social relevance or not, that's fine. And, it, and it's a valid way of thinking. Um, but there's a school of thought of art for social change, which I belong to, that, you know, the Creative is not an alien. The creative is a human being living in a certain society. And you cannot be writing about, I don't know, flowers and, and the sunrise when there's a fire raging outside your window and children are dying of malnutrition. Uh, or just writing on things that have absolutely no connection and you, you don't care about your society. You know? Now, it's important for people to follow their intuition, your deep inner feelings about issues because sometimes you can focus on an issue that everybody around you thinks is absolutely not relevant to your society now. But down the road, the importance of that issue becomes evident. Just like, uh, even, you know, let's take Isaac Newton, for instance. You're sitting under a tree as we hear and the apple falls down and you become obsessed with the idea of why did the apple fall down and not up and and you're living in a society where people are trying to eke out a living from farming and fishing. And, and I'm sure somebody must have told him what is the use of this line <laughs> of inquiry about why apples are falling down. And what, you know, but down the road, that idea has revolutionized the whole world. So I'm always very careful about imposing on anybody the obligation to focus on any particular issue. What I like to encourage everybody is to follow your intuition because your intuition to me is God's voice in you. God put you on this earth for a purpose. He gave you a purpose, a reason. And God, everything God created has a purpose and adds something to the bigger picture. So if you were born here in Nigeria, it's not an accident. And if you were given a particular obsession, a particular issue keeps troubling you, it's not, there's a reason why God has done that. So I, I encourage artists more to focus on the intuition. What I try and discourage them from doing is to become obsessed only with performing art that brings you 
reward in terms of fame and fortune immediately. Don't be so quick to commercialize your art. Realize that art is a calling, whether you like it or not, it's a calling. And the way to realize the full measure of that calling is to be true to your intuition. I understand that you have to eat and sometimes you have to do things to feed, but don't forget the deeper aspects of your calling. And I believe that if artists follow their intuition, they will produce art that has relevance to their society. You know, so I don't dictate to you that you must write about corruption. You must write, writing about a flower, if it's coming from your intuition, maybe what ends up solving the issue of corruption and bribery, because you may help to elevate the sense of beauty. And underneath this corruption, at the root of this corruption, at the root of this way we behave, may just be that we don't have a sense of beauty, a sense of appreciation of order in the world. And somebody can give us that sense simply by articulating what a flower is or, or a bee hopping from flower to flower. And this is how arts help to revolutionize other societies because it helps to awaken a higher sense, a higher appreciation of ideals, of order, of precision, of beauty, of connection, of balance. And when people have this higher sense of appreciation of these values, it begins to translate in how they deal and relate with one another. So this is always what I try and advise other artists. Be true to your intuition, because that's what has brought me to where I am. I remember that when I began to talk, uh, write poems about Nigeria and the politics, it was at variance with what everybody else was doing. Everybody was writing about the moon and the stars and falling in love. And, and what was staring within me was poverty and corruption. And, and, and I, so I just followed my own intuition. And then when I found also that, unlike most other people, whenever I came to the subject of Nigeria, what arose within me was tenderness and affection and love, not anger, not bitterness, not hatred. And yet, when you write poetry on social issues, the, 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 the I don't know, the culture is to be angry, is the angry poet, you know, so you're constantly bashing. But it, I found within me love and tenderness, and I had to be true to that. And I got a lot of pushback. I got people saying to me, why are you saying all these nice things about Nigeria? You're just being sentimental. You're not being real. You're not looking at the issue, you know? But do you have the courage of your conviction as a creative? Because if you do, you find that ultimately, and this applies not just to creatives, but to every human being, if you have the courage to follow the purpose that God puts in your heart, you will find that ultimately you will produce things that will be helpful to your society. I think that's, that's a beautiful, beautiful place to come in. If you follow those things that are indeed um, within you, in your heart, that the good Lord puts in there, many, many times it, it will of necessity be the positive ones that would inspire and um, encourage you um, to be productive positively for your country. And so, and you have shown us beautifully that indeed the creative artist is specially gifted to be able to do that, um, to bring things together that allows the rest of us to better appreciate um, the good around us and to that sustain and encourage us to work to achieve even more of that good and to love our country and love ourselves too, you know, and our families. And so, yes, and it is in, you have demonstrated it. It is the same call and duty that many other creative artists have. And let me say that, so we're talking about you are a poetry performance artist, but there are other areas, the musicians, the artists that actually draw, name it, you know, in whatever form of art you find yourself, um, you do have a, a duty and a call, a God-given call to use it to help to inspire all of us, others, so that we all move on that positive path. Um, I think, the discussion with you is a wonderful, wonderful reaffirmation of the fact that creative art is critical yeah. for nation, for our nation building. Absolutely. And perhaps never more than now, 
um, as we look to the future and come together and continue to come together and work for this country because this country still has some way to go in achieving greatness and for us as its people to live out that greatness that there's a great deal of work to do and we're calling on all the community of artists uh, out there each in your various god-given talents and ways to do the same to inspire to put out there your work that will help all of us on this journey mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. DK, one would have, I'm sure one would have thought, you would have thought that this was what I asked you to be on the set to discuss, but I cannot <laughs> resist the temptation or waste the opportunity of having you also discuss something else that is very, very important. And so we turn at this point to something else. You're a creative artist, a wonderful one, one we deeply appreciate, but you're also one of the great examples in my opinion of a passionate committed young nigeria and so i turn to you this time and pose a different question and i say yes again i, I this is my opinion and i cling passionately to it that this last election actually was um pivotal was epoch making history making so to say for this country I say it's one of the greatest shows of patriotism. I maintain that. And I think young people excelled. Like I said, they participated as never before. They believed, they clung on to the hope of a good, a better Nigeria. And there really should be no turning back from this. And so I'm going to now ask you to contribute as a young Nigerian to what you see as the continuing role of young people in our nation building? I, I share your, your, your view of the 2023 elections and the build up to it. Um, it really was an election where we had, demonstra we, we had demonstrated the fact that it is possible to build a formidable political movement around ideals, ideas, values. You know, this is something that has been talked about for many, many years and has always been dismissed that ultimately that rugged political movement that can deliver votes must be built from uh, the use of money, you know, the cynical use of uh, ethnocentrism, you know, things like that, tribalism, religious bigotry, and then money. Like money is what drives, you have to pay people to do things. And then you have this very rugged, organic political movement that delivers votes in tough, in very tough conditions against the odds, and is powered by volunteers and people who believe in someone not because he has paid them not because not because he has helped them in the past not because he is offering them uh, a share in the national cake but just because he is a simple person who didn't steal government funds who appears to have a lot of property and so because of his values in the civic space that a political movement was, was able to form is a huge step forward for Nigeria as a country. A huge step forward. It shows that it is possible. It is possible. It is possible. And that is, for me, has been such a huge encouragement because I'm someone who is committed, who believes that we need to develop an ideological political culture. We need, to be able, we need to develop movements that are built on ideas and values, not on ethnicity, religion, or money, where people come together because they share the same values about how society ought to be structured in the civic space. So they come together across religious and ethnic lines because they share the same civic values. That is when we build 
strong, cohesive, rugged political movements around shared civic values that our society will be transformed. And this is what I've believed for years. But with every election cycle, you, you, you don't see, you know, people say you're, 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 you know, you're dealing in, fa you're trafficking in fantasies. This is Nigeria. They can't walk in Nigeria. When it comes to election, we know how we do it. And then the 2023 election comes and you see the emergency, an idea is suddenly taking form. Because Nigeria is changing demographically. People are still constructing their political strategies based on how Nigeria was in the 60s and the 70s. But Nigeria is changing. There is a new generation of Nigerians that are coming that are not socially oriented the way the past generation was. So yes, the guy is from Imo State, but honestly, he does not know Imo State. What he knows is Lagos. That's where he was born. That's where he was bred. This, this is not a reality. You can't do anything about it. You can't wish it away. You can lament all you want. But if somebody was born in a different place, their father was born there, their orientation is going to change. Where they think of as home is, is different. You, you can't make me see Imo State as my home. You might preach it and say, we are Imo people, we are Imo people. But by the second, third generation, it's just like it's happening everywhere around the world. Somebody, look, this is my home. This is all I know. Why should somebody push me away and say? And so that struggle is becoming real. You're beginning to see that demographic begin to have impact on the civic and political space. And that's the energy that Peter will be tapped into. It's not, he didn't create it. He just benefited from it. It's a, an organic social reality, something that's happening organically in society. And he was able to tap into it. And that force showed its strength that it can. And so can, can I actually say that some, I define that opinion. Let me just say that he didn't even tap into it. The movements adopted him. It was the other way around. Um, absolutely. Uh, you know, you know? But again, here on the program, we're not, it's not about any it's particular not politics, person. It's not politics, but just using examples. Yes. Just using examples. Yeah. Mm. So what I'm saying is, if, because for many people, the disappointment is my candidate didn't win. But if you look beyond, because changing Nigeria is not about individuals in power. It's about changing the absolutely. political culture. Absolutely. And to change the political culture, this change in demographics are important. And also inventing new ways of thinking. These are the important building blocks to changing our country. It's not just getting electing one person or two people in power. So there is a bigger battle going on. And if you look beyond whatever disappointment you may have about the actual elections, what you begin to see is the appearance of a formidable alternative Absolutely. on the political scene. It's a question of how do we properly harness this energy? How do we properly structure it so that, because already even the old guards know that there is a new player in town, there's a new energy on the table. So we're seeing, I mean, um, the, the, in, I think in 2015 or, or so, the, the, or 2019, the last elections, the APC won with about 15 million votes. Now the APC won with our eight million votes. So you're, you're not seeing you're seeing some you're seeing a decline. You 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 may get oh victory, but the trend shows that a certain thing is declining and a certain thing is rising. So from a time where this third force, because that's really what we're talking about, a third force, from a time when the third force was only getting one million votes at the election, the third force is suddenly getting six million votes at the election. From the time when this uh, turn by turn politics, politics by money, to the time when he used to get 24 million votes, now it's getting 8 million votes. So if you look at the trend, you see that the Nigerian society is trying to turn towards a different kind of politics. That turn may not be completed in one election cycle. It may take three, four election cycles. But if we stay on that path, at some point we will turn away as a society from a politics that is torn by torn, from a politics that is significantly determined. You're never going to be able to remove religion and ethnicity from the table. 
but you can reduce their influence. You can bring other factors to bear on how people consider and rate and appraise candidates. So we're going to move away from a culture where religion and ethnicity determines everything, where money calls the shots, where people line up and take their turns at power, and we're moving towards a culture where it is more competitive, where you are appraising candidates on the basis of their footprints and what they've done in the past. And that's the culture we want to move towards. And it's a long distance race. It is not a sprint. I was just uh, looking at, because I, I, I do this for myself as well, to so encourage myself. And I was looking at the US and the struggle for civil rights in the US. And I just realized that, you know, that between when the blacks lost the right to vote in 1877 and when the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964, 1965, that was about 80 years. And between when the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964, 65, to when Obama became president in 2009, that was another 40 something years. And when you look at that is the reality of a social struggle. It's the reality of it. You can't wish it away. It doesn't happen. I looked at uh, South Africa when the ANC was formed in 1919 and then Nelson Mandela became president in 1994, almost a century. In between, you had the Sharpeville massacres, you had the Soweto massacre, you have, you know, back and forth and people, but you stay on the issue. You stay on the issue. You stay on the issue. That cannot be overemphasized. As Nigerians, we stay on the issue. We march on forwards. We want a good country. Yep. A country that accommodates the majority of Absolutely. us. Absolutely. And so we stay on the issue and we continue. Our question is, talk about you, the young people in this country. How do they stay on that issue? The new movement that appears to have come out of this election, this historic election, how do they source, how do you as young people intend to sustain it so that by the, perhaps the next election, it will be even better performed and done? I mean, that is the question I throw back at you again. It's a tough question because the movement so far has been so organic and uncoordinated and transitioning from an organic movement to a cohesive disciplined movement is always difficult you're at your most vulnerable now because it's not enough to be driven by passion in order to bring about social change at some point passion has to acquire ideology discipline and organization and and that's the step that needs to happen and I don't know how long it will take. I don't know if it will be ready by the next election. I don't know. We may, we may suffer a reversal because sometimes social struggle is not a continuous linear movement forward. Sometimes you go forward and you're knocked back two steps and then you have to come back. So the first thing for me personally, the first thing is to develop resilience. Is the first thing for me is to develop resilience to let to tell myself that it's a struggle. I might be in this struggle all my life and not see the result. Are you okay with that? Because if I can be okay with that, then I'm good. I'm good to go. And a lot of us young people have to cross that bridge. If it doesn't come in 2027, if it doesn't come in 2031, can you stay on it? You know, that's one. So I'm, I'm very interested in developing resilience in myself too. I'm also learning from the experience that why were we defeated? Ultimately, you know, what were the cracks that were exploited to, to weaken you? And I come back to some of these mindsets of ethnocentrism and religious bigotry that some of us have not really been able to rise above it because one of the tools that, all, that have been used consistently to divide nationalist movements, because that's what these things are. Nationalist movements, when Nigerians come together across ethnicity and religion to push for a single issue, that's a nationalist movement in the modern age. 
And the weapons that have been used to divide this movement are always ethnocentric and, and uh, religious weapons. So they'll say, oh, can you see the leaders of the movement? They are all Igbos. And you, you are now Sama, you are joining them. Or you, you are a Yoruba boy, you are joining them. Or they'll say, oh, can you see the leaders of that movement? They are Yoruba people. And you, uh, Ikenna, you are there following them. Well, yeah, continue. And before you know, you start falling back. So we young people still carry that virus of tribalism and religious bigotry. And if you don't extract it from your system, you will not be able to stay on the issue. Because when the issue is being led by somebody from a different religion or ethnicity, you will fall back. You would only stay on it when it's being led by somebody from your own side. But you need to consistently stay on the issue. We're not fighting for people. We're not fighting for ethnic groups. We are fighting for our country. We are fighting for a country where there is rule of law. Where if the electoral body says that votes will be uploaded, votes will be uploaded. Well, okay, okay, let me come in here and say that, again, um, hold your thoughts so you can continue, that you have stated what underscores what is these programs we're having on the stage. It is the issue. We're fighting for an issue. For us, the issue is nation building, mm -hmm. which is much greater indeed than any election. It is also greater than even our leadership. Mm -hmm. The leadership is one facet of, of it. But there are many other things that are part, we all have a role in to build our nation. Mm -hmm. And so, I'm going to therefore remove you from the issue of the leadership or not that went in and say, let the leaders lead. You know, we, we want good leadership because it is key to many things. Absolutely. But, but let them lead. Mm -hmm. what, do the, what do we do? Because it is a forward movement from mm -hmm. apart from elections. Young people, what do we do? Each of us or each of you, us, you know, I'm, I'm a young person at heart. That's right. <laughs> But what do you do towards nation building? What other ways, apart from elections, apart from the issue of who is leading us, what that in the end is the answer that I, we are looking for. What should we be doing to build this our country? In what areas? Yeah. They are very, they're, wherever you are, you can contribute to nation building. Because, like I explained right at the top of the interview, our country, our laws, are, it sits on a cultural foundation. So developing and practicing positive values or certain values contributes immensely to nation. For instance, I'm a poet. I've never held government office, not even interested in holding government office, but I've been able to contribute to nation building by articulating certain values that are foundational to building a nation. So if you understand the values that are foundational to building a nation, and you begin to articulate them and live them, wherever you are, you are contributing to nation building. And one of the values that we need to begin to articulate and build is around the concept of tolerance and acceptance of each other. The idea that because you come from a different tribe from me, you are either inferior to me or in some, some way uh, uh, I have derogatory or negative views about people from other ethnicities and religions is a value that we need to change. So we need to build bridges across ethnic lines, across religious lines, and across regional lines. And this is something that you can do in whatever space you find yourself. Building bridges is driven by learning, interaction, and understanding. It's not a, an intellectual thing. It's not a theoretical thing. It means take your time to learn about the other person, to understand their perspective. I always give the example of the interaction that happened between Zeke and the Sadauna many years ago, where Zeke said to the Amadou Bello, let's forget our differences. And Amadou Bello said, no, let's understand our differences, which is true, let's understand it. Try and see the world through my eyes, because you may disagree with me, but you cannot hate me when you understand me. And what we're trying to remove is hate, bigotry. That's what we're trying to remove. The rivalry may still be there, 
But when people respect and empathize with each other, the way they fight is different from when I have no respect or regard for you. When I have no respect or regard, I can do anything to you. But when I respect you, I'll fight you with honor in accordance with a code of principles. So one of the most important things that needs to happen in modern Nigerian society is we need to increase the levels of understanding, of respect, of empathy across ethnic and religious lines. So northerners need to understand why Igbos are still so sensitive over the civil war. You need to see it from our perspective, see it from our eyes so you can understand. We need to understand why northerners are so sensitive about the issue of the January 15 coup and the murder of the Sadauna. We need to hear the story, see it from their own eyes. So you need to have that, you step into my shoes, I step into your shoes, so we understand each other. That will immediately reduce the level of tension. It doesn't mean we'll not still be fighting, no, but to reduce how we fight and moderate tensions in our society. And this is a work that every Nigerian, wherever you are, can immediately begin to do. As a Christian, you can go out of your way to seek out Muslim friends, to make friends with Muslims, to understand how the Muslim thinks. You can make the effort to pick up the Quran and read it and see what is inside it, to read Islamic books. As a Muslim, you can make the effort to seek out Christian friends and understand how they think. Northerners, Southerners, Igbo, Fulani, as we begin to increase the level of understanding amongst ourselves, we are reducing tension and we are building a, a shared national space, which is very the foundation of a shared national identity. This is not politics. This is social re-engineering and we can all participate in it. So that's one thing that all of us can do immediately that will help. Beautifully said a better understanding of ourselves that breeds not just tolerance, but respect, appreciation, and a willingness indeed to cooperate and work together. That helps us to mentally, spiritually create a nation in which we then live and perform and act underscoring so very clearly the fact that nation building concerns each and every one of us is emotive like you if i may use your word and it starts with our emotions you know and when we have learned and begin from today to practice that that tolerance understanding and appreciation then we we then develop a love of our country and we develop patriotism for our country and when you love something you nurture it you grow it um, whatever role you find yourself in whether you're the clerk in an office or you sweep the streets or you sell in the market because you are doing it in a country where you believe in and you feel a part of you do it to the best of your ability because in the end that is what will make or break Nigeria um thank you for sharing the beautiful insights that you know even embedded in a unknown perhaps by the colonial masters in in the concept of the niger and nigerians are many significant um issues that should make us proud of where we happen to find ourselves and work towards making it the great country i, I have always believed it is which god created it to be so, DK, thank you so much for being with us on the show. Thank you for, so much for showing our viewers indeed that we all need to be part, must be part of nation, our nation building, um, of may, helping us to, again, understand the beautiful role the strategic role of our artists, our creative artists in so doing, but also reinforcing the fact that we don't all have to be creative artists, but each of us, we're here on earth for a reason and have a role and a duty towards contributing positively to our country, Nigeria, 
and that our country, Nigeria, is great. And we can only reinforce and showcase that greatness by all working constructively towards a greater nation. Thank you so much for being on set. And to our viewers, please join us as we continue this journey of restating what should be obvious to all of us. That in the end, the bottom line is the, the common objective of building a great nation, one that can, as much as possible, accommodate all of us. Each of us has a role to play. In the coming series, we will continue to discuss the roles of the various sectors. But each of us in our daily duties, in our life as it is today, have a role to play. And it's a role we must begin to take seriously and indeed to live. We thank you all, even as we continue to wish for and pray for a great Nigeria. Join us next week. Thank you.